Welcome to another big game indicating dogs Q&A. We're trying, we're going back to an old, old format today. I'm doing another long form Q&A here with quite a few questions and I'm going to put them all in the same podcast and I'm going to attempt to go back to putting time codes in the description so people on YouTube and I could put actually I could put them in the description on the podcast too but if you want to go and click on your the question you're looking for you're probably better off to do that on YouTube because they actually if you put a time code on YouTube you can actually click on the time code in the description and it'll flick you straight to that part of the video it's pretty cool so I haven't been doing that for a while um but I had an idea, well I haven't been doing it for a while because I hadn't had time, um, I've got a new idea that I'm going to try writing the time code off my sound gear onto my notes as I'm doing the Q&A and then hopefully I can find them quite quickly um, when I'm editing and posting and add those time codes in instead of sitting down and re-listening to myself talking for like three hours to do the time codes. Um, so check, if, you want, if you're listening to this, these Q&As on the podcast and you want to see if the time codes are working again, jump over to this podcast on YouTube, on the Big Game Indicating Dogs YouTube channel, jump in the description. If it didn't, if my idea didn't work, I'll put sorry it didn't work. If it did work, all of the time codes to all of the questions will be in the description and you'll be able to click back and forth and go in and go to the individual questions. First question. I haven't got the person's name here. Um, this is a question from the Inner Circle. Um, hey team, I'm in the process of finding a dog. I've found one that's 21 weeks old and my partner has concerns regarding socialising it with our two cats. Do you think I might run into issues making them friends or am I overthinking this? So this has come up a bit and I've seen it a bit and it's funny. Um, <laughs> I'll go over my notes and we'll dig right into this, okay, because this is quite an interesting one and it's, it's sort of at the top of my mind at the moment. Uh, first of all, a few people in the comments said, nah, you're overthinking it, mate, good as gold, I've got a cat, I've got a dog, my cat and dog are fine, so you don't need to worry about it with your dog. Cats and dogs are never an issue, <laughs> pretty much. And it's funny because I saw a post on Instagram last night too, and a, a guy just randomly put up a post, uh, say, with a, and it was like a photo of this new cat that he had sleeping next to his dog, and it was like, We've always had cats, always had dogs, and my cat, people, over, people, what did he say? He said something about people think that cats and dogs, that dogs have some, like, intrinsically thing thing in their head that they don't like cats, so you're going to have, like, he, he said people, he basically said people are overthinking it. I've always had dogs, I've always had cats, my cats and dogs have always been fine, so... <laughs> I mean, basically saying, so no one's ever going to have a problem with cats and dogs. Now, my next note is, 99% of the time it's fine. And my note after that, for a small handful of people, it's not fine and it's a really freaking big issue. And uh, My, my bottom, I'm skipping to my bottom note on this. Again, some people say this is overthinking, but as a professional dog trainer that works with lots of people, you see all the worst cases. And I've worked with people that have had, that have got a dog. The, the In this case, it was the guy had a dog and, and his partner had a cat. And um, his dog, granted, was a, and, and it's always dodgy ground, like trying to, and, and it's always a huge generalisation saying one thing is worse with one breed than the other. But I have, this is just personal experience that I've had, and I've worked with a lot of different dog owners, is that um, German wire hair pointers, some of them, like a disproportionately high percentage of them, hate dogs, man, uh, hate cats, and can be really difficult with them. Um other breeds tend to be good. Vizslas tend to be good. 
Um, different breeds of dogs are different, man. I don't care what anyone says. They are different breeds of dogs. There's um, different breeds of dogs have a higher chance of having a higher sort of propensity or tendency to be good or bad or into or not into certain things, you know. Um, but all of that's sort of a bit of a tangent and beside the point and just um, I'm sort of shotgunning a bunch of ideas out there. To narrow it down, I th to say it's overthinking, I, and I think for, for a lot of people that, that it probably is overthinking and your cat and dog will be fine, but to tell, and it's funny, you know, and, and this is why these podcasts, these long-form Q&A podcasts are so important and why so many people find them so helpful is because I can really go in and cover these things properly from all the different directions because comments like that, oh, don't worry about it, you're overthinking, or I've always had cats and dogs and it'll be fine, so don't worry about it. Um, if you say that to a 1,000 people, 2,000 people, 10,000 people, there's going to be people in those large groups that actually end up having serious freaking issues in their lives and households with their cat and their dog. Um, but there's some, pr if in, in like if you say 99% of the time it's fine, in like 999% of, 999 out of 1,000% of cases, if you handle it the right way, you will be fine. I wouldn't want to tell you, asking any question about that is overthinking, don't worry, you'll be fine, just don't worry about it. I would. This is what I would say, okay? If you raise and train the dog right, you should be fine. If there's no structure, you could have issues. Um, you know, in a series like the Deer Dog Training Blueprint or the Palmico Dog Guide, we give you that whole fully structured system all the way through to follow. So you, you crate your dog on the way home, when you get home, you have a crate at home as well. We show you how to use leads and long lines properly right from the start. In both series, I show you, and, and actually in the Deer Dog Training Blueprint, I have that whole segment in part one where I put the long line on print and I introduce him to fly, another dog, and I use that interaction to show you how to use a long line to control a puppy right from day one. So so you're not just throwing your pup into situations where you have zero control and it's just doing what it wants. That's what I mean by if you raise and train a dog right, you should be fine. If you have no structure, you could have issues. So the, the structure would be no structure would be no long line and just like you arrive home, a puppy on no long line. Even as the pup ages, it might be fine with the cat when it's tiny, but one day when it's four months old, it, and if, you're, if there's no structure, you might open a door and the cat does a certain thing at a certain time and the puppy chases the cat, and the cat goes and runs out of the room and skidding across the floor and just makes it out the window, up a tree, hissing at the pup, and the pup barks at it. Now you've got an issue with your pup and your dog. You, you've, you've, and if there was a lack of structure leading up to that, so you didn't have a stop command, you, you, you don't already have a foundation of training in place at that point with that young pup, you continue to neglect structure and training, so you don't. From that point onwards, you don't gain a foundation or control, and you continue to have not enough structure around the house, and you keep putting the puppy, the a pup or a dog and a cat, in situations like that. It's going to keep happening, 
and it could, when I say if there's no structure, you could have issues, and it could escalate, and it could get really bad and really niggly, and if you let that happen enough, you could wind up in a situation with a with an older dog and a couple of cats that now you're ringing me <laughs> for a one-on-one session and asking me how to fix it, but it's this whole situation now is a long way down the road and it's really freaking difficult and now no matter now you're in a very difficult situation and it's really difficult to unwind so that's why when i see someone ask a question hey i'm thinking about getting a dog but my partner's concerned about the cats people are like you're overthinking it mate don't worry about it i've always had dogs i'm like uh, stop <laughs> Because I've literally, and it's not a funny matter, I've literally been in that situation with people that I'm working with and they're in really, they're in a really tough spot with a dog that they've had for a couple of years that they really freaking like and their, and their partner that they really freaking like as well has a couple of cats that she really likes and the dog is, has almost killed her cats a couple of times, like literally. And they can see situations and it's escalating and getting worse and worse. And the cat's and the dog's been like, Rah! like it's trying to kill it. And the cat's only just got away. And it's a full on dog. And that dog, they've watched that dog break somewhere else, catch a possum or a rabbit or a pukiko and scrag the, and, and murder stuff. <laughs> that dog kills stuff like ruthlessly and everything the cat's only just getting away it's happened twice and that dog was doing the exact same it was acting exactly the same like chasing it as hard as it could and the cat's only just getting away and they're like he looked like he wants to kill that (laughs) and it's like yeah he probably does because that's what some dogs do. It can be a real issue, man. Real issue. And again, 99% of the times it's fine. 999 times out of 1,000, if you do everything right, you'll be fine. But it's not It's not something that no one ever has an issue with. It's not. Some people have really big issues with it. And it's... it's uh, it's one example of a million things that can be difficult and turn into a problem if you don't have any structure. But um, if you do have structure and you train right and the Palmico Dog Guide or the Deer Dog Training Blueprint will give you all of the tools and the routines for that, you'll be you'll be fine. So that's what I would say. And, and you know... Um, that's basically it. <laughs> um, a bit of a rant, but it's important, man, because again, it's one of those things that I've seen people get into real tough spots with. And, and like, you know, this, again, this guy's got a dog and his partner's like, you're not keeping that dog. It's trying to kill my cat. And he's like, I don't want to get rid of the dog. And it's tough, man. It's like people get in a situation. They've got to get rid of the dog. Um, and then what sort of life's that for the dog now and if it's not properly trained and it's already got issues it can be difficult to find a new home and next thing it's just not good so that that's what and and you know so that's why i take these things so seriously um because it's really important right this is where right when i start my next question i've typed the time code in There we go, and I should be able to find that easily and put the time codes in on YouTube for you guys. Patrick, do you have a first aid kit for your dogs? Had a few close calls and wanted to see if I need more in my kit. It's a really good question. Again, Patrick asked this in the big game indicating dogs in a circle. You go in there when you buy the deer dog training blueprint. Um... Quite a few people said this is a really good question. Look, look, or someone else said, I'm really looking forward to um, seeing your answer on this. Good question. Um, 
I don't carry a specific dog first aid kit when I'm hunting, but I do carry a, a really good first aid kit for myself. Um, it's got, I, I could probably do like an Instagram post on this or a short video or something just showing what's in it, but it's pretty common sense sort of stuff. But, um, um, and to be honest, I used to be quite slack with this and it was when I was doing the professional hunting stuff and um, we actually had to have, like, the, we got a list of stuff that we had to carry and it got checked and everything. And, and it's, that's a um, one habit that I've carried over from that that's been really good. Um, in my first aid kit, I just have normal sticky plasters just for little cuts and stuff. Like the amount of times you'll, you know, I'll start off real basic with this. The amount of times, if you don't have a decent little plaster, you'll nick yourself or have a, get a scratch or something. Um, and if you don't have a normal plaster, you're taping it up and it's bleeding and getting dirt in it and all of that. So just normal old plasters for the small stuff and good ones too. Good ones, you know, those real sticky elasto plasters last or something I think is the brand real sticky grunty ones um they're like plasters made out of good strapping tape you know with the little little patch on the inside of them um I use I carry a good selection of those the the small ones just the small handy ones and also you know how you get those big strips of plaster that you cut to the right size that you want I carry a bit of that too and then if you do get something bigger that's not like a big gash that you'll use a bandage for or something then you've got those bigger plasters really handy really handy and if you want to go full on especially if you're doing you know week and 10 day long trips and stuff like that or multi-day trips a, a, a small amount of a good antiseptic cream is really good too um betadine's pretty hard to beat um, you know, years of trapping and working in the meatworks and environments like that, I found Betadine um, to be really good and just keeping stuff clean and changing the plaster and cleaning it every day and putting Betadine back on it, um, really good. And it is important, man, because um, I, let me think about this. I had tendonitis in my ankle once, that pretty much, uh, I don't think it did actually. It almost buggered a trip. I just stayed in there and let it come right, and then rested it, and then trapped again, and then. But it was a pain in the ass for a while. I never flew out for it. Um, the only times I've 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 been flown out of the bush for a medical thing was when I got an infection in my finger that started off from a tiny scratch, uh, and I looked after it too. Was the annoying thing. I did clean it. I did put plasters on it. All of that. But it was on a real munted finger that I've got that's got that's been chopped up and bashed and broken and stuff, right like a few times right from since I was a kid. And um, I've got bad circulation in there. You want to really watch out for that. Um, I got bad circulation in that finger, and um, uh, so it's bad for scratches. And it, it it hasn't. It's got bad circulation, so it's it's bad for um, getting infected. But, um, and another time too, it was, yeah, it was basically an infection and I saw a guy, a guy got flowing out and it was for like an, this infection thing in his leg, you know, so that basic stuff, plasters, um, a, a small amount of antiseptic cream, you know, because you don't, my first aid kit too, by the way, is about, it doesn't weigh much, probably weighs oh 400 grams maybe you know it's a little it's about the size of a normal brick if that i've got it in a little waterproof um dry bag thing little real lightweight dry bag <clears throat> and it's pretty small um so plasters and antiseptic cream you get it um some good big bandages and, and and wound pads, you know, the old non-stick wound pads. So if you get a big cut or a big hole, um, you want to be able to put a, one of those wound pads on it. Uh, you know the wound pads, it's like white fluffy stuff with sort of clear plasticky stuff on each side. It, it helps to stop bleeding. If you just put a normal bandage over something that's bleeding 
real hard, the blood will just keep soaking into the bandage for a lot longer. If you put one of those good proper wound pads on there, that's what they're for, um, it, it, it creates more of a seal that stops the bleeding quicker. So if you get a big hole, you want to get those that on there and then you want to have good bandages to go over that. Um, and I carry one normal bandage. You notice the white fluffy bandage that you'll normally get put on something. Just a normal white bandage. Um, I carry one good one of those, like a good roll of those. So if I got a big gash somewhere or even something like a burn or something silly like that, um, and I have about three or four quite decent size wound pads, so if I did end up with something quite large, a big scrape, you know, if you, if you fell over and had a big scrape right up your leg or something, or a big cut or gash, I can cover it in wound pads and I can wrap it with bandages and just cover it and stop bleeding. Um, so plasters antiseptic wound pads a normal bandage and then I have a big quite a big um, pressure bandage you know the stretchy stuff that sticks to itself I've got a big one of those too and that's about compression stopping bleeding and just again if, if you ended up with a big wound you could cover it with pads get one bandage around it and then and then pressure bandage over top of that um I don't really have painkillers. I think I might actually. You can, I mean, <laughs> anything that, oh, I've never really used things like aspirin and disparin and Panadol and stuff. Anything that that is going to help, I just wouldn't take anything for. Um, um, I've used Nurofen a little bit for like back pain and things like that. Um, I think at times I've actually had a couple of quite grunty painkillers in there, like a, like Tremadol or something. Um, obviously prescription and get a subscription. I'm not telling you to put bloody, <laughs> to carry um, powerful drugs and painkillers. Obviously consult a doctor with all of this stuff. Don't listen to me on bloody medical stuff. Um, but, I've carried that, you know, like if I'm gonna if I'm gonna carry a painkiller in my um, first aid, I'll tend to want it. I, I tend I, I want it to be a good grunty one. So if I like break my leg, you know, br like break something, um, and I'm laying there in a lot of pain, and I've set the EPIRB off, you know, it might be a good couple of hours, a few hours, whatever, before someone turns up. And if you've broken something, uh, I've had injuries before. I used to ride motocross and things. I've, I've had broken bones and gnarly injuries and been prescribed um, drug, you know, grunty painkillers before, pethidine, um, uh, what do I say before, tremadol and things. So I know, I know when I would take them. Um, and... That's what. That's maybe one other thing you could add is that a good decent painkiller. Take if you'd use Panadol, carry them. Um, <clears throat> in case you hurt yourself big time and you're laying there in major pain, waiting for help. Um, another one, actually, another one too, particularly on the longer trips, is um, antibiotics antibiotics and um, even if you're in the bush for a week or 10 days um, having good grunty general antibiotics again talk to your doctor make and just and your doctors will do that I've had that in the past uh, when I was doing big long trips in the bush six eight weeks at a time um, and I think it was actually after my finger and I said to him and he said how the hell did this get so bad what the hell because it was pretty blowing up it was actually they they said to me um, that they put oh, oh, they put me on a drip an antibiotic drip you know like main line main in the vein antibiotics and they said that that finger 
potentially in another like 24 hours, the infection could have been in the joint and in the bone and you probably would have had to get it cut off. So you don't want to piss around too much with infections either. Um, they tend to be very painful before they get to that point and I've seen that a couple of times. I've had it myself and I've seen it in other people too. When it, If something starts getting like real sore, like you cut you like that finger, um, it got to the point where I couldn't put it below about my shoulder. If if I like the day leading up to flying out, if I put it down, it would just womp womp like throb like mad, and I'm like ah, <laughs> and I'm walking around holding my hand up like this, um, and the whole thing just blew up and was all red, and I couldn't even use the whole hand. It was just really painful. Um, and I, I saw that with a mate's leg too. He had an infection in his leg and um, it brewed up for a few days and the, the day we were like, oh, well, you got to go, is he, he couldn't get out of bed. When he tried to swing his leg down and put it on the ground, you know, getting out of his bunk, um, like we, we, we we're both in the same hut and we woke up and I'm laying on my bed. It's like, you know, you wake up in there and you're in the same hut, like our bunks are bloody five metres apart and... His leg was pretty sore the night before, and when I woke up, like, yo, you wait, yeah. It's like, sweet, and you sort of about, to, who's going to put the jug on sort of thing? And um, I was like, how's your leg? <laughs> He's like, oh, does it, oh, it's a bit sore, but I don't, I don't think it's changed much overnight. And he went to get up, and he swung his legs over, put his legs on the ground, foot on the ground, and went, ah, nah, and swung his leg back up. He, and it was just throbbing like mad. When, when you lowered it, you know, you need to keep it elevated. Um, but in hit with him, <clears throat> we got on the mountain radio. Luckily, we had a mountain radio, so we didn't have to set the e off. We did find that putting a call through to the mountain radio and telling them that I actually tried to not say that it was an um, emergency. I just said, yeah, g'day, you know, all here, you know, you know, they knew knew me and knew where I was and all that, obviously. And um, I said, "Oh, we just need a chopper in here this morning. We're just going to fly a bit of gear out and bring a bit of gear back in." I didn't want to say that my mate's legs bloody bad, and um, they were like, "Oh, the weather's kicking off pretty bad. Probably not the best day to do a resupply, would it? You know, I think you'd wait for that." And I was like, "Oh, you yeah, know, nah, we could probably, you know." We, we, we really sort of need to do a bit of a resupply here. And, and he kept, <laughs> he kept like, arguing with me. Oh, no, nah, I think you should wait. You know, pretty good weather coming in. And I said, oh, actually, my mate's legs, um, bugger. We need to get out of here. As soon as you tell them that, um, it's basically out of their hands and they have to report it as someone in the bush in trouble and then it's out of my hands, out of their hands, and there's just this whole freaking procedure thing that takes place. And um, it was actually a pain in the ass because I knew the forecast and I knew Derek at, um, it was Lakeland then, now it's Halley Resources. I knew he could have come in, he would have could have been there in 15 minutes and flowing us straight out. And I knew the weather was brewing. That's why I said, like, your leg's pretty bad. If you don't get out this morning, you're not getting out. You're not flying out of here easily for a couple of days, so you you better go. Um, and then because it, then they have to go over top of Halley Resources and let the rescue people know. At that point, it was, wasn't was windy in Murapara yet or where we were, but it was already windy in Talpo or wherever the bloody rescue helicopter was coming from. And they said, yep, we're just waiting for the weather or something, something about the wind. We can't get out due to the wind. But I knew the forecast was saying it was picking up. So they waited for like a good couple of hours where we're going backwards and forwards on the radio waiting. They were also talking about sending a foot rescue in, like a bunch of guys were maybe coming around via the road and heading 10Ks down the river with body stretches and stuff. And right, and, and right at the last minute, they put it through to Halley Resources and said, we can't get in there, go now. And Derek flew in and picked my mate up like 
right as it, it was kicking off, man. It was kicking off big time. It's the only time I've ever seen Derek. Um, one of two times I've seen Derek like calmly comment about and and <laughs> the wind was just kicking off hard out, and he landed and walked up to the hut and um, my mate sort of limped out and we're standing there and I was just talking to Josh like oh we like because I had to we had two trap lines out and we had all this shit to sort out and we were talking for like. 11 seconds and Derek just quietly said um hey we better go and when Derek says something like that it's like you better go Josh jumped in the helicopter he said they went over the first ridge the wind was so strong that um the helicopter just caught this head-on wind and just like lifted up and he said that was like just real windy chopper just getting thrown around big time and like about half an hour later when I was leaving to go do two trap lines um, it was just a full-on storm, and the tr- it was like dangerous being in the bush that day. Um, it was so windy, but um, so hence antibiotics. If we just had a head, same with my finger. If I just had a head, a little bottle of decent antibiotics sitting in my first aid kit, um, we would have been fine. I'm trying to remember what the hell it was. I think it was an, even things like ear infections and stuff like that. Like, um, I think that's what it was when me and Ben were in the bush. Like, this is a couple of years ago now, a year or two ago. And um, I'm trying to bloody remember. I think it was. It was a, a it was an earache kicking up, and I'd had a couple of ear infections, and. Um, I was like, man, I've got this ear infection kicking off. And Ben was like, oh, i got some antibiotics, good grunty ones. For exactly that, you know, he was on to it. And um, that can be a real good one, man. Um, and, uh, I, I, yeah, I've actually, um, yeah, no, I won't say that. But um, even on a week-long tar ballot trip or something, um, your mate gets an ear infection or a tooth infection or something starts kicking off. You you cut your hand you cut your hand on day one and by day or even if you go in with something a bit funny, you have a toenail kick off or something. It can be that's probably one of the most common ones, like without being crazy and you know falling off cliffs and being an idiot and stuff. Um, infections, man, and so a good general um, antibiotic. <clears throat> um, antihistamines is another real big one and this that's a big one for the dog um, and yourself <clears throat> if you get honed out by bees or wasps or stinging nettle antihistamines are real good and um, I've had that a few times um, stirred up a wasp nest and got you know, a heap of stings, and um, you will feel like shit if you get, I mean, this is, even if you're not allergic, um, if you get 15 or 20, like, grunty wasp stings at the right time of year when they're humming, um, you'll feel like shit later and potentially the next day, and if you take an antihistamine, you'll, you won't feel anywhere near as bad, um, and it can help with the swelling and the throbbing and all that sort of stuff too. Um the, st- the same with stinging nettle. Um, if you fall over or you're just a bit of a dork and stinging nettle, I've done it before, like looking for a deer that I've shot, and you know, a deer that's rolled down into the crap and, um, you know, climbing through horrible shit in the dark and you can't, and, it's, and the stinging nettle's all mixed up with ferns and stuff and you feel yourself getting stung here or there and you're trying to avoid it, but you end up getting stung a few times. Um, and it yeah it hurts straight away, but it's just sort of a, ah it's just a bit of a ping. Um, and if you're wet and you're getting scratched and crashing through the shit, you don't feel it that much. Um, I've done it once really bad looking for I shot a deer on a slip right on dark, and um, 
Yeah, you got to be you got to be careful about where you shoot a deer right on dark, obviously with long range shooting and that. And um, I'd never shot a deer on that slip. I didn't know how bad it was up there. And um, shot this bloody deer. The shot wasn't that good, and I ended up spending quite a bit of time climbing around the shit. That's the story. When I was crashing through all the crap, and I felt myself getting stung. Um. And I was sort of pissed off looking for this deer, pissed off at myself looking for this deer too for taking the shot and not making a good shot and stuff like that. And um, and it was real tight, gnarly shit. And um, once I got back to the creek and I was having a bit of a break before walking back to the hut, I could just feel like, <laughs> I don't know how many times I got stung, but it was kind of all over my body. My arms and my legs were just harming and um, then I had like an hour and a half up the creek, got back to the hut, and even that night laying in my sleeping bag, my whole body was just humming and um, didn't feel that great, and I felt like crap the next morning. Just woke up like I'd had bloody two dozen beers the night before, you know, just like hung over, bit headachey, really drained, and just felt like crap. Um, antihistamines can help a lot with that sort of thing. It's at, it's at least, they definitely help big time. And um, so antihistamines for wasps and stinging nettle, and they can help a lot with your dog. So <laughs> this is turning into a bit of a, a bit of a tangent, like a lot of these answers do. But um, uh, and like all of the stuff, uh, you know, not the antibiotics and the painkillers and things. Antihistamines um, give half one to your dog. If your dog gets honed out by stinging nettle or um, bee stings, um, which is, you know, pro- like if 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 um, that's probably one of the most common things that I've had a real issue with in the bush, like um, as far as medical stuff, when I've had to like open probably the most common times I've opened my first aid kit is for cuts and scratches for my plasters and. Um, Betadine and stuff, uh, and antihistamines for me and the dog for stinging nettle and wasp stings, um, and just give your dog half a one. You know, antihistamines are usually these tiny little pills, um, and just chop it in half with something and give the dog half a one, and you just put it on your finger and shove it right down their throat. Just slide it right down the back of their tongue and pop it right down their throat. Um, and they can't spit it back up. They just sort of do a big swallow and it's down there. Um, <clears throat> and they can help massively, man. <clears throat> I've seen, I've had it where a dog's got honed out and they're swelling right up and getting quite bad and give them an antihistamine. Half an hour, 40 minutes later, it all, all these swelling starts going down. Um, and even, you know, like, because sometimes stinging nettle and wasp things and that can get actually really quite bad in dogs and dogs can have a bad reaction. So, so can people, and it can be a little bit unpredictable and weird. Sometimes you get, um, I don't know why, but sometimes you can get quite a few stinging nettle stings or wasp or bee stings and not feel that bad. And then other times you just get a couple and it really hits you and you feel like shit. Um, I know with wasps and uh, bees and things, different times of year and different weather and that, they can be more aggressive and sometimes their stings seem to have more punch to them. Um, and it's probably how good they get the sting in too and same as stinging needle. You can just sort of get a little brush with stinging needle and it and it, it still stings and you're like, it hurts. Other times you can hit it real hard and, it, and the spot, it, it, so it goes into your skin better. You know, so it's not like a linear thing, like a bee sting ain't just a bee sting and a stinging needle ain't a stinging needle. It's like you can get whacked real bad or it feels, and then another one feels exactly the same. It doesn't have much effect. So um, nowadays, if I just get, you know, and I'm not full on with stinging needle. I've heard people say, oh, if you get stung with it, you should go out of the bush and go to the hospital and that. (laughs) Um, If that was the case, I would have had to go out of the bush and go to the hospital pretty much every day of my whole trapping career in, in the Uawera because um, you pretty much get a little sting every day. You walk, you know, you're doing an hour and a half in the creek or two hours in the creek every day. You pretty much get a little tag somewhere every day. Um, but every time I get, 
like tagged up with it quite bad. Um, and you sort of get back to camp and you're sitting there like and you've got a whole arm humming or something. Um, I just pop half or a whole antihistamine. Um, and every time I get a wasp or a bee sting, I just pop one too. Um, and it just buttons it right off. Um, and with the dogs, the same thing. If I see the dogs get a wasp sting, I just give them one straight away. Um, and and um, a stinging nettle, same thing. Um, like that night, that me because the print was with me that night. I was looking for that deer on that when I got honed out, looking for that deer on that slip. Um, and he was bloody when I was sitting there in the creek, like having a, a muesli bar and that before going back to camp, and I was humming. Print sitting there next to me, like psh, psh, sneezing and rubbing his face on the ground, and because he'd been honed out too. And um, you'll see them; they'll be, they will, they'll sneeze because it gets them on the nose quite bad because that's where they haven't got hair. So they'll be sneezing and like yeah, on their nose and around their face and paws and stuff like that. Um, indicating dogs it's nowhere near as bad as pig dogs because pig dogs, if they bail a pig in the stinging nettle or hold a pig in the stinging nettle because they'll be getting bashed around in there so the, the stinging nettle is getting pushed through their fur and that as they're fighting. Usually indicating dogs walking through it don't get honed out that bad. Um, but but they can do if you get in enough shit with it and you climb through it for long enough, they will. And I'll just give them one because it can, it can knock the dogs around too. And I've I've never seen a dog honed out by stinging nettle that bad that they're having like a, a real nasty response to it. Um, but I've seen them pretty uncomfortable in that. Um, but pig dogs, um, it's actually quite common for pig hunters to carry like a full on epipen thing in some places that have a lot of stinging nettle. Um, because pe- I think people have had dogs die from it, particularly when, like I say, when they've, their dogs have held a pig or fought a pig in the stinging nettle, is when they'll get really honed out. Um, so plasters, antiseptic, normal bandage, pressure bandage, wound, patches, antihistamines, antiseptic, painkillers, um, as far as dog specific stuff the only other two things that I have at home because you can use the, I mean the main thing you're going to use on your dog I think other than antihistamines is um, bandages you know if the dog somehow gets a big cut I, I, I'm thinking about this I've heard of one indicating dog got its paw ripped open quite badly um, when the hunter like stood on a big rock and the rock rolled and landed on its dog's paw and the dog's paw got ripped open. Um, I've heard of an indicating dog falling off a cliff, just like being too cocky indicating goats and some dogs are real blasé around steep stuff. It's funny, some dogs are scared, naturally scared of it, some dogs aren't. Um, and apparently his dog was real lax with it and it was like indicating a goat over the side of the steep stuff and next thing like something moved and it fell off a bloody big cliff into the river and it survived. Um, I've also heard of particularly goat bailing dogs that are chasing goats around steep stuff and um, I mean nannies too and, but and Bill, like nannies will, will bunt a dog you know but particularly big billy goats with long horns they'll you know the horns stick out the side they'll flick like that and and they'll flip they'll and they'll lure a dog back to steep stuff and um and then charge them and try to flick them off like um if you've ever seen tar there's the odd video of tar fighting and that's the whole name of the game for a goat their whole life is um if you fight with someone you just try to push them off the hill you're on you know so they know how to do it um but with indicating dogs, it's pretty good, eh? It's 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 a really good low maintenance setup in that regard. Like as far as your dogs tend to stay pretty healthy, they last a long time. They're not running their guts out. They're not fighting deer and 
pigs and charging around and stuff, it's it's a really good healthy setup for the dog. Dogs don't tend to get injured bugger all, you know. Um, but if they get honed out by bees and wasps, you can give them antihistamines. And for the stinging needle, um, if they somehow get cut really badly, um, you've in your in my first aid kit, I've got the wound patches, a one big bandage, and a big pressure bandage um, to stop bleeding. Um, one thing that I don't carry that I should really look into is um, tourniquet. A tourniquet, you know, the thing that you wrap around and like cut off bleeding with. Um, the reason I don't carry them is because back in the day, like when you're doing first aid courses and stuff, they say don't use tourniquets because um, you don't want people willy-nilly using tourniquets. Um, because if you use one when you don't have to use one and you use it incorrectly, you can like completely cut off the circulation to a whole limb and ruin the and like wreck someone's art, whole arm or something. When you could have just put pressure on it to stop the bleeding, you wrap a tourniquet around it and like wreck their whole arm or something, you know. So tourniquets can actually be really dangerous. Um, and you really have to know when and how to use them. Um, but that's one thing I wouldn't mind no knowing when and how to use them and carrying them because I have heard um, in recent years, particularly with the internet, you know, and, and you, you, you get the opportunity to hear a lot of different types of people talking and see the information and, and you know, podcasts and YouTube videos and following people on YouTube and that. And... Um, I've I've seen it a couple of times in recent years where people have the whole tourniquet spiel and like um how people first aid teaches you not to carry them mainly because you actually need a bit of knowledge and it's not just uh you know that people they every a lot of real mainstream stuff they try to make it super idiot proof so they actually sometimes leave out stuff that could actually be helpful just because um they basically just put it in the too hard basket and say, no, nah, don't tell people to use that because people are too dumb. But um, people are actually quite smart, <laughs> most people. Um, and, uh, yeah, I've heard people give the whole tourniquet spiel and say, I know people say you shouldn't use these, but um, I've been the people have been in situations and they know, like, it's particularly um, military people, people that have been in the military and trained in the military, they do use tourniquets in the military and they teach you how to use them. And I've seen people have the whole spiel. Like, I think we should teach more people how to use tourniquets. And that, and I've seen people spiel where they've said, like, if we didn't have tourniquets in this situation, my mate would have died or I would have died. And, and they're basically saying that they believe there is value in teaching people how to use tourniquets properly and having people carry tourniquets because sometimes when bleeding, something's real bad. Um, putting pressure on it ain't enough and you need a tourniquet and that's when a what a tourniquet is for but you got to know when to use it and how to use it apparently you can tighten them up and let a bit of pressure off let a bit of blood in and then tighten them back up again and stuff like that I don't know how to do it I'm not telling you to do it but it's just something I wanted to cover off here um, I bet you it's all over YouTube about 4,000 times how to use tourniquets um by some people that actually really do know what they're d talking about too. Uh, what else was I going to say here? A couple. I tell you a couple of things that I do have at home, and you could for the dog specifically, and you could carry these in the bush. Is um, a staple gun, a, a pro, and you you get them from the vets and stuff, um, and they're properly made for dogs. It, it's a it's pig hunters carry them quite a bit. Um, for if a dog gets really badly ripped up in the bush or like a real bad wound where it like opens something up real gnarly. Um, and I mean, and I'm a bit weary with this one, guys, because I, again, I, I'm just, I'm not giving you medical advice here. I'm just talking about like the stuff that I use and, and, um, 
before you do any of the stuff I'm talking about, like talk to your doctor, say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this, that, and the other, make a little list of what you want to do, and talk to your doctor and just check with them what if you should actually use this stuff. But this is just some stuff that I've been thinking about. Um, I do have, uh, and for your dogs, talk to your vet, okay? Um, you get these staple guns that are specifically designed to use with dogs if you if a dog has like a bad sort of medical emergency type thing, big cut on your dog, and and it would be beneficial to the dog for you to be able to handle it right on the spot. Um, you get these little staple guns, and uh, they've got like little medical grade stainless, these fine little staples, and you just like hold it, by the skin and and squeeze this big trigger on it and it just pulls the skin together and um, creates like a stitch, like staples a big a big wound together. Um, so you can basically close up a wound really quickly and easily and then there's these little forcep things that you take them out with and it just basically does a reverse of what the little staple gun does and just really cleanly and easily pulls the staples out. Um, I've seen vets use them, and um, and I've been given the little forcep things to take them back out, and I do have uh, they're like they're sort of disposable. They're a little plastic thing that you get. I don't know, it's like twenty bucks for a pack of two or something like that. Might be way more than that. I can't remember. I brought a couple years ago, and I've never used them. Um, but particularly like when I had a heap of dogs around home doing boot camps and even just having dogs myself and doing longer trips, I, I can't remember exactly why I bought them, but I bought them just for that, to have around as like a, an emergency thing if something happened um, because I'd seen them used and friends of mine that do a lot of pig hunting use them and they said, man, you, you should really have a couple of these things laying around. Um, and there's some... Um, there's some really good grunty like wound sprays, very similar to um, betadine that you can spray on a wound. So if you're in the bush with it, if you did want to basically carry everything that you could carry to deal with it, a, a you know medical emergency with your dog in the bush, um, that might be something you want to look at. Um, again, like check with your vet. Um, don't take medical advice from me for you or your dog but um, that could be one thing that you want to ask your vet about uh, one of those staple guns and a, a good I've got a really good antiseptic spray it's specifically designed for animals um, and the spray is quite good because if a dog has got something you can sort of hold it and just spray it on it's easier than trying to wipe like an ointment onto a, an injury that a dog's got um, and that's about it but my final notes here on this and this is quite a big one for me um, the most important thing is to be careful and have good safety and management um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm huge on this eh? um, I play it very safe it definitely cost me some and it has definitely cost me some animals over the years. Even it's cost me some trophy animals over the years, even. Like I just play it safe when I'm hunting. Um but one of the most important accolades I think a hunter can have is that you've never seriously hurt yourself or anyone else when it could have been avoided. And you've never caused a big unnecessary rescue operation. I don't, like I couldn't think of anything worse than uh, making a mistake and and doing something silly and causing a big injury to myself or someone else. And obviously, with the shooting side of things and target identification and stuff like that, obviously, no one can think of anything worse than that. But even like, I think a lot of people don't think about about the um, other side of it, you know, like um, obviously navigation and getting lost, but also hurting yourself or like flying into the bush for two weeks or 10 days and not taking antibiotics and 
the poor old local pilot has to come and pick you up in the pissing down rain um, and a heap of wind because your mate's finger's about to rot off or something, you know, when you could have taken um, some first aid stuff or, um, you know, you were clowning around on some steep, dangerous shit that you just shouldn't have been on or your brain was out of gear on the way back down the river because you don't think about that sort of stuff and you ass up and break your ankle or something when if you had it actually had your brain engaged and be think and just had that one little like self check like just take your time you've got your torch let's just make it back to camp safely um back in the day when I first started working in the Uwearas um, and even for my whole hunting career leading up to that, um, no EPIRB, no mountain radio. If you hurt yourself, no one's going to be there for days or weeks. Like if you stuff up bad enough, you're dead. And it's going to be a long wait <laughs> it's going to be a long wait and a long time laying there to think about how stupid you were while you die. And um, so it, you were just in a, I, I was just in a totally different um, mindset, you know. And like a lot of the old, old school, all of the old bush school, all of the old school bush guys were like that. You know, um, like the first thing that the old old Bruce Dawson, the fur buyer, ex color, ex meat hunter, like old school bushman and quite legendary in certain circles. The first thing he said to me was, I'm not going to piss around with guys who don't know what they're doing and I don't want to have to come and look for you and I don't want to have to do a rescue operation. I don't want to, like, don't. Be a dick. Don't stuff up. That was the very first thing he said to me because he was going to be taking me. If I was going to trap there, he had quite, quite a few blocks and I ran out of possums and I said, I want to work on your blocks in the bush that you got there. You know, we talked about it, but he was trying to say, no, nah, no, nah, stay where you are. And I said, I'm out of possums. I need to go up there. And that was the very first thing. I rung him up on the phone and said, Bruce, I'm telling you, I'm out of possums, man, or I am. And he said, that's a very, okay, th that rant that I just gave you okay but I'm not going to piss around with guys that don't know what they're doing and I don't want to do rescue operations I'm not he gave me that whole rant it's the very first thing and um, again I think it's one of the most important things I reckon like that is the most important I don't care how many trophies you've got if you've also like <laughs> Had to go get your farm, get the farmer to tow your truck out of the river, and you've like set off your EPIRB before, and you're just a clown. You know, granted, accidents happen. You know, and uh, oh, trying to think here, of touching wood, I've never had a major. You know, and that's and I'm um, uh, I like I like that. And I want to keep it that way. And I think it's really important. And again, I think that's one of the most important accolades you can have as a hunter. That you obviously want to be successful. You know, and I shoot plenty of animals. Um, but I don't care how many animals you shoot if there's all this stupid shit going down around it, you know. And um, just like... 100% carry first aid, carry an EPIRB, carry all of that stuff, but the most important thing is safety and management and and um, having your brain engaged, knowing where you are, how gnarly it is. Never use the fact that you've got an EPIRB and that as an excuse to go, oh, buddy, go do that because, you know. And I, not that I think anyone's doing that, but... I, I do think that it's important to dr always drive home that message of like it's everything's sweet until it's not sweet anymore 
you know, and it's real easy to get a little bit blasé and be charging around out there and um, all of a sudden you're that guy that's setting off an EPIRB or that they have to come rescue, you know. So um, uh, Andre the, from Hunters Club had a good uh, line about this on a podcast that he did with Dwayne Sweeney. Um, and he was talking about tar hunting and mountain hunting and, you know, going, going extreme and how, you know, the, for a, particularly for a while there, there was a bit of a trend starting off on, like, the extreme hunting and, like, breaking out the mountain climbing gear and ropes and helmets and <laughs> crampons and um, it was turning into a cross between, you know, extreme alpine death-defying mountain climbing and hunting and um yeah i thought i i always thought like when i first started seeing that like that's cool on its own like if you want to climb mountains climb mountains if you want to be extreme be extreme um but if and it, but to me that's not hunting that's like you're mixing you're trying to pull something else into it you know, and I think a really important part of being a good hunter is um, doing it safely, like really safely. And um, Andre, I thought, had a really good take on this on Dwayne's podcast where he said um, that he'd done a couple of extreme things trying to recover tar and had a couple of, you know, Moments where it's like, holy shit, I probably shouldn't have come around here. I've had that. Um, not so much tar hunting, but just, and more as a kid, um, you know, growing up in the outdoors and doing a lot of hunting for a long, I've definitely had a couple of moments like that in rivers um, where I've, I've been like, holy shit, I almost died. Like That was real close. I've been like shaking, like... Um, when you have that near miss car accident or something, when a car pulls out and you just swerve and like holy shit, and you're like your your legs like shaking on the on the um on the clutch pedal. After that, I've had those moments in rivers. Um, but Andre had a really good take on it, and he just said, you know, I've had a couple of sketchy moments back in the day. We thought stuff that it's not worth it. But here's the big punchline. He said. And the, the silliest thing is, is the, I'll paraphrase him, but he said along the lines of, the thing is is that once you understand the animals in the country and hunting, you actually don't actually need to do that to shoot them anyway. To sh even he was talking about like big bulls. You, do, you don't actually need to do that to shoot good animals anyway. You definitely don't need to get all crazy to shoot good numbers of animals like meat hunting and shooting hinds in the winter and things and which is something that we need to do way more of anyway. And, and, you know, we need to, I think, yeah. Um, I was about to go into a whole nother spiel, but, um, yeah, he had a good take on it. Just that and you don't even need to do it to shoot good animals. So like chop her down a gear <laughs> and um, make safety a really big priority. It should be, you know, right up there top of mind. Um, and for really most really experienced people, not all, um, and a lot of old school guys, it is right up there. Um, but it's definitely lacking and, and sometimes you see people chasing content and stuff a bit sometimes and, and trying to make a video or something and and I think, yeah, I, I've seen stuff where I think people are getting into some territory for the content that's like getting a little bit full on but um, that's my answer to that. So, um and it's quite a long ramble covering a heap of stuff. But, um, and like I say, I could do a, a quick post on this, but, um, 
plasters, antiseptic cream, wound bandages, uh, wound pads, normal bandages, pressure bandage, um, antibiotics, painkillers, antihistamines, and you could go the staple gun um, and some other stuff for the dogs. But um, but the most important thing is to not, like, the first day, oh, and my EPIRBs in my first aid kit, I could potentially have the, should have the EPIRB on my on a belt pouch or something right on my body, but and I do do that sometimes. But my first day, my EPIRB is in my first aid kit, and one of my main goals every time that goes in my day bag is that I don't have to pull that out. That's the one bit of gear I never want to have to freaking use, and that's yeah, it's the way it should be. Um, Brendan. Recently I did a bush stalk with a friend and the dog and my, oh, time code. Did I forget a time code? Time code. Where are we? <laughs> um, oh, no. Well, I was on the wrong. Sorry, guys, I'm just sorting my life out here. Um... One o six. Marky, I was on the wrong bloody question anyway. I scrolled too far. Marky, looking at looking to get a lab for retrieving. Should I train him with the Blueprint Foundation and then do retrieving work? How should I go about it? Um, okay, so looking at getting a lab for retrieving, should I train them with the Blueprint Foundation and do re then do retrieving work? How should I go about it? I don't know if you're talking about getting a lab just for birds or getting a lab um, for birds and then adding retrieving. But... um. I mean, sorry, or you're talking about getting a lab for deer work and then adding retrieving later, or you're talking about just getting a lab just for retrieving. Um, how should you go about it? Mark's asked this in the inner circle, so he's obviously got the blueprint. 100%, man. Um, I would just start with the blueprint stuff. Um that's essentially what I used with Miko early on, and um, she's cranking now. And the only reason I had issues with her is because I did some stupid stuff that I wouldn't do again, you know, um, with her getting electric shocks retrieving her first couple of birds. But um, otherwise she picked it up real quick, man, and, um, um, and was bloody good. So, yeah, I'd just start with the blueprint, and it does give you a really good foundation. And we've had a lot of people uh, follow the blueprint, train a good deer dog, and then add retrieving on top of that, and good as gold. And the blueprint does give you an awesome foundation. You've got your stop, go, come, recall, all your control, um, and and a good relationship and bond with the dog. And it, it makes it really easy. Like trying to try... <laughs> Trying to train a dog to retrieve before it's got a real solid foundation um, is really difficult. But once you've got that really solid foundation and dialogue with the dog, stop, go, come, um, <clears throat> it's, it's really easy. It still takes quite a bit of repetition and slowly building it up, you know, a lot of little steps. But it's way, way easier once you have that foundation. And um, it's actually how a lot of top bird dog trainers do it overseas. Instead of starting with the system when you start throwing dummies and stuff when with a young pup, 
people actually, uh, and I don't know how long this has been around. I know um, some really long, you know, as far as taking like over a year to train a bird dog is very common. But I was listening to a podcast, um, I think it was uh, the Hunting Dog podcast, that guy that um, uh, was on Meat Eater, the dog guy that was the bird dog guy that was on Meat Eater has got a podcast, and he was talking to a guy, uh, he was in the States, but he was a, a well-known bird dog trainer, and... Um, he was talking about like he was starting to use English labs and he was talking about how much you love them over the American labs and how much more biddable they were. And then and they were talking about he had a really cool take on training. I really enjoyed that podcast. And um, he was talking about how he doesn't train a forced hold and um, about how some guys in England really good bird dog trainers like top tier don't even start training their retrieve till the dog's a year old and that's like people that are training purpose specific bird dogs so and really good trainers too so um which is interesting because so they're obviously getting all of their foundation down for all of those same reasons if you just start trying to throw retrieves with an untrained dog it's a mess. You haven't got anything. If you get a really well trained dog and you train it and you train a good hold and you throw it, throw a dummy, the dog goes out and picks it up and then you give you a recall command and it brings it back and you've got a retrieve like bang, straight off the bat like that. You've still got a lot of work to do before you've got a good duck dog but you've got the bones of it straight away. And if you've got a stop, like on its second retrieve, you can say sit and it sits and you can throw it and it stays. And if you, cause you've got a, remember how I said stop, go, come. If you train a stop, go, come and hold, you've got a retrieve because you say sit, your stop command, you say sit and the dog sits, you throw a dummy and the dog stays there if it's a proper sit and you say, where you go, which is your go command and the dog goes and you've got a hold, it'll pick it up and hold it properly and if you've got a recall, it'll bring it back. Like straight away, first session, ever retrieving, you'll get tidy retrieves happening. And that's why those guys are doing it that way. And and that's the way that I do it. And it works really freaking well. And the blueprint gives you all of that. Stop, go, come. It also gives you a lot of scent work. The dog already knows how to hunt, wind, track, all of that stuff. Um, you've got all your introduction to gunfire and all of that and all of the other skills that we need. You know, obstacles, traveling, in and out of the truck, um, the water, like tons of stuff. A, a, a well-trained blueprint dog already has like well over half, if not three quarters of what it needs to be a good duck dog. And it's very easy to layer nice structured ret retrieving on top of everything that the blueprint gives you. Um, and that, I've got the um, bird dog training boot camp coming out which I'm in the process of basically completely remaking. Um, after this season with Miko went so well and she's basically cranking and and um, I've got a bit more time now. So I've been, that's what I've been doing over the last week or two is just get going back through all the footage and, and I'm basically starting all over again and, and um, instead of it just being sort of a quick little series that I'm just was pumping out leading up to last season, um, and then just quickly put it out, and it'd be a little. It's I'm still going to call it the Bird Dog Boot Camp, but it's going to be a hell of a lot more than that. It's actually going to be a really solid bird dog training series. Um, and it's going to be really good to layer on top of the blueprint. Um, 
man, I keep saying this, but because I was going to just start putting some of it out, and then last week I spent like half the week just going back through the whole thing and looking at all my footage and working on it, and then I decided I'm basically going to remake the whole thing from scratch and make it like way better. Um, and it's going to be quite a bit of work, but uh, I should have it out in time for people to do a good bit of training before next season. Like I should, all going well, especially if I, which is what I should do, is put a bunch of other shit aside and just hook into it. Um, uh, you know, I'll have it out in the next couple of months. In the next couple of months. Um, I'll have at least the whole first phase of training of it in it and up so you guys can get it and start and you'll have, um, man, you'll have eight or ten months before next season, which will be heaps of time, heaps of time. Um, you could probably do a lot of it in two to three months, but after doing it that first season with Mika, it was a bit quick. It was a bit quick and... Um, you could maybe do it if everything goes perfectly, but you run the risk of putting too much pressure on the dog and making your job harder than what it needs to be. You're actually, it's a bit of a make haste slowly thing. And, um, but if you've got six or eight months, that's enough. If you've got a year, that's heaps. That's heaps. If you've got a year, if the dog's already 12 months old and has a foundation of the blueprint, um, and you've got a year, that's heaps. Um, but I want to get it out in time for people to work on their dogs between now and next season because I know there's quite a few of you um, and it's going to be a, a bloody good series. Um, hmm. um, I'm going right into everything, man, right from the start of training a bird dog, the whole basic retrieves, blinds, multiples, sides, everything, the whole lot. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so back to Mark's question. Um, looking to get a lab for retrieving, should I train him with the blueprint foundation and then do retrieving work? How should I go about it? Yeah, man, that's exactly what I'd do. Yep, and um, you, if it's only going to be a duck dog, you arguably don't have to be so extreme about range and keeping it in. Um, other than that, man, I'd do everything, the whole lot. I really would, and I'd actually get the range pretty tidy too because as you, which is what I did with Miko, she was on a long line right from a pup, and now, I mean, I just put a video on my Instagram of her doing a, you know, 100, 120 metre retrieve. Um, she'll go long, man. And, like, when we're working in cover, rough shooting in that, I have to, use, I have to like, give her reminders to stay close enough. She'll go further than I want her all, all the time. But, and here's the big but. I've got all the tools to need, I need to have her wherever I want her. I can let her go long, I can tell her to go long, or I can keep her in, I can put her in behind, I can have her at 10 metres, I can have her at 20 metres, I can have her wherever I want her. Um, and <laughs> she's uh, she's going pretty freaking good now. Yeah, she's, I've got a heap of footage there, eh, of her bloody dragging geese out of the pond and um, finding, doing these epic finds on woundies. Like, that... that um, that foundation of stuff in the blueprint, like how to use the wind and tracking and all of that, um, like Miko was tracking, like shooting ducks on the stubble in the evening and when it all happens in a flurry and um, she, and she'll be in a, in a dog blind behind me and I just tell her, get on your bed, and she gets in the blind. Um, that's that's in, her going in and out of the blind is on on a YouTube video that I put up recently. Um, that's on the Paul John Michaels YouTube channel. Um, a little video there shooting a few ducks, um, and 
but tracking and stuff, like all of that work, indicating work that's in the blueprint, um, I basically set her up like that and, and handle her in a very similar way. And for example, things like, um, like I was about to say, shooting ducks on the stubble, on the maize stubble, right on dark, and basically nothing happens to the last 10 minutes and you, you're trying to, half the time you shoot half your limit or your limit in the last bloody 10, 20 minutes. Um, they all turn up right on dark and, um, you know, a duck comes in, you shoot it over there and it, you, you go bang and it drops, it's half, it's already getting dark and it just drops over there and then you just tuck straight back in your blind because another one's about to come in and then after the hunt you go over there and the duck's not there but you go to where it landed and Miko just puts her nose down and starts tracking exactly like a deer. And um, I, I didn't have a real long one this year. I had I had a couple of crackers though, shorter ones, but absolute crackers that I've got all on um, film for the bird dog boot camp. But um, last year I had a couple early in the season um, where she tracked these walking ducks for like bloody two hundred meters, two three hundred meters right like because I'd, I'd obviously just wing them and they'd just hit the ground and started walking and then I'd left them for 15 20 minutes you'd be amazed how far a duck will walk especially when you're sitting there shooting a couple of other birds um, they just hit the ground and start walking and out in these real big open maze paddocks and they just walked all the way down to the end of the paddock climbed in the drain and then climbed right in under the into the tightest little shittiest bit of longest grass they could find and um, Miko just tracked them exactly like print tracking the deer and I just saw her put her nose down, handle her all in the right way and um, yeah, she tracked them and find them and you follow the dog way down the end of the paddock and she goes into the drain and under the grass and pulls one out and um, that's a bit of an extreme case, the long track like that and like 15 minutes later in the dark following her with the head torch but also like countless birds and and all that stuff from the blueprint on how the wind works and training our dog to work scent on the wind properly and all of that. Um, basically seeing a duck land out in the paddock, go around downwind of that area and she just hits that wind and rides in and then puts her nose down and starts tracking and then like flushes this big drake out from the in between these two rocks and stuff like that. Like it's all... And then obviously the retrieving as well, out of the water, um, out in paddocks, long retrieves, going out long and hard and after runners and all that sort of stuff. But um, And the, the one that's floating in the water right in front of you, that's easy, you know. Um, but what I'm saying here is, is that the blueprint, it really does, man, and all of that extra stuff and, and the range and control and the scent work, and the introduction of gunfire, everything. Um, man, it, it just sets you up. Gets all of that stuff done, and then in the bird dogs boot camp, we can just really focus on that retrieving. Uh, but other stuff, uh, marking will layer on a, a whole other layer of introduction of gunfire for shotguns, and because they're louder and like a lot of multiple fire and stuff. Um, I'm going into handheld dummy launches and remote dummy launches for people that want to do that. Um, I've got all that there. Um, I'm going into, I'll sh also show you how to do it without having to buy them because the handheld ones aren't too bad, but the remote ones are pretty freaking expensive. Um, I'm going into all of it. It's going to be pretty cool. And I'll also go into a bit of extra stuff so people that haven't followed the blueprint but they've just got a dog that does have a, the basics of stop, go, and come. They don't have to follow the whole blueprint either. They can just start off with um, the bird dog boot camp. But if they do get into trouble and they don't have enough of the basics, they can jump on the blueprint too and, and tidy up with the blueprint um, because it does give you a really good foundation. Time code. writing the time code guys so so you can easily find the right one if you want um, Brendan 
Recently, I did a bush stalk with a friend and the and my dog, and my friend was in front with his rifle, and I was about ten meters behind him with the dog and the rifle. I didn't say much unless the dog gave a clear indication, as it was my friend's first hunt. Assuming the dog is fully trained. Is this the best way to approach it or would it be better for me to be in front with the dog and once we are onto something, call my friend to come in front? Um, my first note here is it's best the way you did it. Yep. Um, I reckon overall it's best the way you did it. Are you, if so, Brendan's got a fully trained deer dog. He's put through the blueprint. He went for a hunt with his mate and Brendan just hung back with the dog and his mate was out in front stalking um, and he's wondering if that was the best way to handle it I think it is in general but I've got a few notes here and a bit of stuff um, you could go in front with the dog the dog's definitely going to hunt better with you in front and the dog's going to hunt better in front of you so if you like as, as the main position of work of a big game indicating dog or a deer indicating dog is out front put them out in front give them that 10 even 20 meters range to move around and and work and wind properly um that's how they can do the most work and get the most done and the best result um but if it's your mate's hunt and you're trying to get him a deer putting the dog out in front and you going behind the dog and then your mate being behind you, there is a high, there is a really good chance that you'll spook a deer that your mate doesn't get that your mate could have shot if he was out in front. Because even when you're hunting with an indicating dog, the deer either has to have walked, right, your dog has to walk over top of where the deer's walked for it to track it, or the dog has to be directly downwind of the deer for the dog to wind it. If the dog, if the deer is off to the side, while the wind's in your face, or if the deer is straight ahead while the wind's slightly on an angle, the dog's not going to smell the deer, you know. And um, one way or another, usually. Most of the time, as you get close to a deer, the dog's indicating one way or another. It's smelted on the ground. It's smelted on a swirl of the wind. Hopefully, you're, hunt, you're trying to hunt with a pretty good wind anyway. You can't always. You're often hunting in a bit of a side wind or you're taking a bite of the wind. Or you, I've got that um, video on my YouTube channel where I explain hunting over an indicating dog and on the whiteboard and drawing all those lines and how the wind works and how I explain those hunts, you know, it ends up being all over the bloody place. But um, you quite often do see deer that the dog isn't like fully locked up on. You'll just be sneaking along and shit, there's one. You know, it might be a direct indication the dog might have taken you that way uh, by tracking or it's winded that way so you start moving in that direction and then, um, then the wind starts hitting a bit of an angle where you're moving and, and the dog or the deer's moving and the dog doesn't have a direct wind from the deer. And we, we talk about this in the blueprint, like an indirect indication is when the dog starts indicating that way, you start heading that way, but the wind keeps shifting and changing or the dog could be tracking or the dog just could be getting the odd swirl here or there or it could be... It could, the dogs can even indicate fresh ground scent. If a deer's walked across the ground and it's nice and fresh and damp and everything, if a deer's just walked through up ahead and the wind is in my face and now the deer is actually 20 metres to my right standing out on a nice open face there and... I'm walking straight ahead my, and, and the deer's just walked through and the wind's in my face, the dog will start winding and stalking because it can smell that a deer's just walked through up ahead and they can wind ground scent from sometimes a decent bit of a distance. And you, so you all of a sudden you're like, okay, something's here. You start sneaking, 
you slow down, you're looking around, and all of a sudden you look out to your right and there's a deer standing on the face over there and you shoot it. That's a du- that's an indirect indication. The dog's indicated, but it hasn't actually locked up staring straight at the deer. There's about there's I mean there's a million different combinations of different ways it can all go down. And um the direct like wind straight from the deer is the ultimate because it's a straight line to the deer with the wind perfectly in your favour. But practically, once you start hunting, depending on the type of country you're hunting, if you can get on some nice big long faces with an uphill breeze, you can start start to get it pretty good. But it's it's often pretty challenging to do that. Um, so, and dogs can actually hunt pretty freaking well at heel too. I've been doing more and more of it with print. I used to do a lot of it back in the day, but then I went through a big phase where I sort of stopped doing it. And I've been doing a bit more of it lately. Um, and particularly as the dog gets a bit more experience. Sorry, mate. I just kicked print in the head. He's under the table. <laughs> Sorry, mate. It was only a a light one. Um, what was I saying? Particularly as the dog gets more experienced, um, they and they can they can and, and you're really good at reading them, and they're confident. Um, print hunts really well at heel, you know. And um, if we're starting to get real, if he's getting a good wind, he'll tell me about it. He'll he'll like step up. He, he's and he's not way in at heel that like a big shut down heel. He's doing nothing. He's sort of if the track gets real narrow and niggly, he's right in behind, and I don't really let him like step over me or pass me. But if he's got room and he's smelling something up front, his head's soon coming up past my knee, and he's and he's like bumping into my leg, sticking his head out, winding like mad, letting me know, and um. Even tracking, like the, the dog can't track from heel. It can't, you know, and that's a big thing. So if um, the dog's got to be up front and working to track, but now that Prince got so much experience and confidence and I'm really good at reading him, um, even tracking, man, if, if, if I'm walking along and, and we hit where a deer's walked, he'll just drop off from behind me and track out to the side. And he's like, letting me know and he knows that that's what I want him to do or he'll just do that whole thing stick his head out past me and I'll see he's, and he's if he's looking at the ground I'll step aside give him my walk in front hand signal it's just a silent hand signal and he'll just quietly step out in front put his nose down start tracking so it's a that it's like a whole other layer to the whole thing and and there's a huge amount of stuff that you can do there um, with the dog and hunting it from the heel and reading it and the way things could play out from there and the way you handle the dog and um, let it go in front or read it from behind and switch back and forth and all that sort of stuff. So, um, And that's why, so for all of those reasons, I think if you're doing a hunt, and it's like you say, it's your mate's hunt. The whole idea is to get him a deer and you're going for a walk and you've got your deer dog. I think, and and he says here, assuming it's fully trained, I think assuming it's fully trained, you're best off to have you be in behind and have the dog in behind. And and like you say, you said, you didn't say anything to your mate unless the dog was indicating real hard. And um, once they get good, man, once they're cranking, they can do 90% of what they can do like especially wind wise and if you haven't been too hard on your dog and you haven't shut it down too much um they can do 90 percent from the heel of what they can do out the front and uh even the tracking i've said before i've, I've been quite bullish on that in the past day eh, that all oh, the dog you can't have them in behind it's got to be up front you can do a lot from him behind, man. Um, you can. And um, sometimes if it's real open and, and like the, the hunt I did recently, it was dead freaking calm, bush hunting seeker. 
and uh, there was just no there was bugger all room for movement. Eh? It was just um, and there was a lot of deer, and and print was wind, was hunting real good, winding real good for a minute heel, and um, and I, it was really hard to get up on them, and you just ha- I had to you had to stalk really carefully and slowly. And you know everything. I'm pulling out all. This. I'm even being careful with my body movement, um, keeping my arms in and moving all slowly. And bloody, it was a real pain, and it was really difficult. I spooked a lot of deer. It was a real shit run. Um, so, and, and you know, print was working really well out front, but um, a lot of it, I just had him tucked in right at my knee, and and um, at heel, and he goes works really well there and um, man he was on to everything I didn't have when we had a lot of contacts and um, I didn't have a contact where I thought oh man print couldn't indicate that because he was at my heel it was either he was either indicating it from heel or if I if I before I spooked it and like lead, sneaking me in um, or we spooked it and the minute it spooked, I sort of took note of the wind, and oh, that makes sense because the wind wasn't right for print to indicate it, you know. So, um, and a lot of stuff he was indicating it way out from the heel, way out. It was pretty cool. And a lot of the times, it's not it's not what you would imagine. Like the heel can be far more dynamic than what you would imagine. Like if you think a heel's a heel, and the dog's just always in behind, just stuck there. When you're hunting and stopping and starting and standing around and waiting and, you know, bush stalking, you do a lot of, like, especially if the dog's indicating over the rim of the hill and you sneak up to the edge and big open thing and the dog's just peeking, indicating. So you're just standing there and it's just dead quiet, open, and you know there's a deer right here somewhere. You just you do a lot of stopping and standing and looking and waiting. And... um print was real nice and he'd just like and then I'd stand there and I'm trying to work it out and then I look he he knows like we're just bouncing off each other a lot and if I'm standing there looking and looking and in 10 seconds goes by 20 seconds 30 seconds longer he knows I'm looking for it and I can't find it and then I look down to him to see where he what he's doing where he's looking and and he picks up on that that I'm now looking to him and he'll just take like a like he'll, like a couple of half steps, get up next to me and wind out, have a good wind, have another check, and I'm also watching him feeling the breeze on my face, and he's indicated over into this gully. We walk up to the side, and. Let's say the breeze is like at my 12 o'clock looking down into this gully. Um, sorry, I'm, I've got like I'm right on the edge of a, sne- of a sneeze. <laughs> um, he's indicated down to this gully, right? And I sneak up to the edge of it and look over and I've just got this epic view of this big bush gut. Like I can see... 70, 80 metres on a 180 degrees out in front of me. Print's peaking, so there's a deer right here somewhere, and if I take the wrong step at the wrong time, it's just going to squeal and go running away. But if I play my cards right, I'm going to see it and shoot it. And so I'm just standing there just like looking, because it's all bush and fern and crap everywhere. There could be 50 deer in there and I couldn't see them if they are all standing in the wrong place. I'm waiting for something to step out from what behind a tree or a fern or whatever. And, um, I mean, there could be a deer down there standing in plain sight. I've got so much to look at, it's going to take me a bit to pick it up, you know, to be able to see it. They're really camouflaged little buggers. And um, sometimes that breeze is on your 12 o'clock just coming straight at you. Like the dog's taking you over there, he's indicated hard. So you go over there, come over the brow, and the breeze is at my 12 o'clock, straight in my face. And Prince, like, ears up, looking, and he's sort of scanning the whole gut. 
and then you feel that breeze turn like a quarter turn and now it comes from like my two o'clock and when that breeze turns and then print will just lock up like go next level lock up just like and he'll take like two real little steps forward and just almost get the quiver on steering I know that deer's at the two o'clock and then and then the wind shifts and print just keeps looking down at that two o'clock because he's just got a direct wind like well we were still 80 meters back and over the brow and print first indicated that way as we hit that wind he just got like wind of a deer somewhere that direction and it was only a slight breeze so as that wind's still coming up out of that gut print can still smell a deer but he's just smelling deer He's not smelling like direct, you know. He's just smelling the scent of deer coming out of that gut. He's just sort of standing there looking around. He knows something's right here, but he's not pinpointed. And then when that wind shifts and he gets that direct scent and locks on, then I'm like, that deer's that way. Forget about the, well, you be careful because there could be another deer in that gut somewhere. And if you spook that, that'll squeal and take that other one with you. But at least you know that w- one deer, if not the deer, is, n- is in that exact direction. So there's a lot of... Um, I'm not just reading the dog. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the wind and which direction it comes from. I'm watching the dog, watching the wind, looking at... There's a, it's, a, it's like a a massive algorithm you know when the dog winded back there now he's getting you know so there's something out there but it's not right in front of me so I can go a little bit faster now always oh, looking a bit keener now so I'll st- this is a nice gut so I'll stand here and watch this a while breezes in my face as he looks keen but it could be it, like, he's not locked up yet but it could be here wind shift bang there it is and there's like a million different combinations of all the different things that can happen um, that you're just constantly working. And you can, at, as you get to know it better and better and the dog gets more and more experience, you can do a lot of it from in heel, man. So again, another massive side tangent, but um, Brendan, I'd be doing it exactly how you were doing it, man. Um yeah, you could like try to be real hardcore and just be like, get back behind me, mate. I've got the deer dog here. I'll let you know when there's a deer up front. But, um, and that will actually work quite well a lot of the time. But, um, and it all depends on the situation too, you know. Depends how many deer are there, what the country's like, what the wind is like that day, how and where you can get set up. But again, you still do shoot a lot of deer that the dogs aren't dog isn't locked up on, and you shoot deer that the dog hasn't indicated at all. Like I said, if if you're hunting into a side wind, and the deer straight ahead, the dog can't indicate it. So, and they can indicate a lot from the hill. Uh, another time code here. Next question. <clears throat> Sorry, guys, just typing that in. Um, Matthew, I've got a six-month-old lab who is going really well. However, sometimes is very slow to sit while walking. He stops perfect, but more often than not, will have to step in, and I will have to step in and push his bum down. Still early days, but any suggestions here? I usually only try to say sit once before stepping in to try and not show him he doesn't have to listen. Cheers. Yep. So Matthew's got a six-month-old lab. He's training with the blueprint, and sometimes it's slow to sit. Do I have any suggestions? And and he's given me a bit of other really good context there. Um, my notes on this is, like, it's good that you've asked the question because his sit should be fairly consistent by six months. At the six-month stage, six months old, 
you've still got a lot of work to do on it. Obviously, you're going to do, in the blueprint, you're going to do a heap more distraction on the stop and automatic stop and stop to the shot and heaps and heaps of stuff. But the pup should be pretty consistently sitting when you say sit by that time. It's pretty common to still be at this point at three or four months old, but if a pup's still doing it by six months old, I'm, I'll be starting to go, come on, man, what, what what's going on here? Um, and again, it's definitely not going to be perfect at six months, but it should be getting pretty consistent in very short, easy drills. Um, my first note here is, you can get into a situation using that step in drill, using the say sit, stand on the long line. If the pup doesn't sit, you step in and push their bum down. You can actually get the dog into a situation where it thinks you stepping in and pushing its bum down is part of the sit drill. Excuse me on the sniffing, guys. I've got a bit of a I've got a bit of hay fevery thing kicking in here. <clears throat> I'm talking about too much talking about antihistamines earlier. I need to maybe I need to take some. Um, <clears throat> you can get that point, man, where the the pup, if you've been a little bit too linear and and you've you've created too much of a pattern you know in the blueprint we talk a lot about breaking up patterns in dog training and stop drills dogs will start recognizing patterns uh really really quite quickly sometimes um uh The dog can st- the pup can start to think like that's how the sit drill goes. You say sit, it stands there for a moment. You say sit once more, it stands there for a bit longer. And then when you step in and push its bum down, that's when it's meant to sit down, and then it gets its pat. So um, sometimes you really can use your commands more to help the dog, and just try and break up the timing of it. Like sit, stay there. And even the timing of like, yeah, the way you step in, step in slowly, giving the pup a uh, opportunity to start sitting before you get to it, um, releasing the pressure quickly as soon as it sits, the way you step back again, the timing of stepping back again, again, breaking up the patterns, and yeah, it can be a little bit of a funny, sticky one. It's it's rare, but um, Print had a bit of a funny issue thing with that. He just it took him quite a while to get it. Um, Print's an awesome dog, and he's really smart, and he's in a he's a really really good he's really good hunter. Honest as the day is long, humble. He's not a pain in the ass. <laughs> but I've seen smarter dogs. I, I really have, man. And, and <laughs> he's he's a really no, he's a nice dog. But that's all, that's all I'll say. I've seen smarter dogs. Sometimes he just takes a bit to get stuff. Um, Miko picks up on stuff way quicker. She's real smart, almost too bloody smart. Sometimes um, there is a such thing as a dog that's like the reason a dog is what it is is because it's. Their, their IQ is, they've got the average dog has has an IQ of a bit, actually no, I think it's the smartest dog has the equivalent IQ of about a three-year-old human. And um, that could seem like a disadvantage, but trust me, there'd be no way that they would be... Uh, the way they are, which makes them so awesome, if they were, if they had an IQ of one hundred and twenty, <laughs> like it's one of the it, it's one of the most amazing things about a dog is is once you understand it, it can be frustrating if you don't understand them, but once you understand them, 
and you know how to train them and communicate with them and you know how they think and you know how to work with them. It's actually freaking amazing what they'll do and they don't overthink things. And That's like Print. He's so freaking loyal and he just wants to do what you want him to do. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult to... It's more difficult to get him to the point where he understands that. But... And, and at, some dogs get really, really smart and they start to get a little bit, they start to think for themselves more and you run into sometimes more challenges in other areas. They can be a bit of a pain in the ass and hard to handle. There's a real sweet spot sometimes or it's always a, it's often a bit of a trade-off. It's often a bit of a trade-off. I heard another guy talking about um, bird dogs a while ago, and he, he was talking about how full one of his Labrador retrievers that he's got is an absolute beast, like a beast, will just retrieve anything, anywhere, anytime, anyhow, like um, jumping off the boat into crazy choppy water and just like, it's quite difficult to get a lot of dogs to do what this dog will do. And straight away he said, She's just smart enough that I've been able to that that she like you can still train her, but she's just dumb enough to do what she does as well. <laughs> Which is uh, you know, people you could take that the wrong way, but um it's an interesting take, you know. But um and a lot of labs, I think a lot of what makes a lab, people talk about labs having a heart of gold and them being so bulletproof and this, that, and the other. Um, I've had a lot of labs for a long time, and uh, not lots and lots, but I've had Labradors. I grew up with Labradors. Um, I've, I've had a few and um, worked with a lot. I've seen a lot of dogs that are smarter than a lot of labs is what I'm trying to say. And um, so maybe it's something like that going on, man. I'm sure it's an awesome dog, um, but maybe it's not that smart. It's taken it a while to pick it up. It's interpreting the way it's interpreting it. And it can be very surprising the way some dogs interpret some things. Um, you can't give them too much benefit of the doubt. You know, you've really got to be open to the idea that that and sometimes it's hard to wrap your head around. You're like, nah, but you and you start to tell yourself, oh, he knows and he's just not listening. But nah, he still you've done it this many times for this long, this carefully, and he still doesn't actually know what you're trying to get him to do. Um, that's a that can be a really I've talked about this in the podcast quite a bit. That's a really big hurdle to get over. And, and talking about, or don't give them too much benefit of the doubt, depends which way you're looking at it. You've got to give them lots of benefit of the doubt that they're not being a dick. They just don't understand it yet. And even sometimes you can be doing a lot of stuff right and they still don't understand it. And that's this is actually, you know, really... It's, it's the whole key to dog training, really, is understanding their limitations and how they actually see the world and being able to structure the training and being able to carry it out in a way that the dog can understand what you're trying to get it to do. And and the more effectively you can do that, you'd be amazed at how quick they'll pick stuff up. And, and their willingness to do it too is incredible. Like, um, Some people say dogs don't have the ability to take the piss. Like they don't have the ability to be a dick I think they do but um, dogs do stuff that they want to do when they know you don't want to do it because they want to do it more than they don't want to do something that you don't want them to do but uh, there's not a lot of that the level of that in most dogs is a hell of a lot lower than than you would ever believe and that's the whole mental hurdle of like getting over that, that now nah, they do actually want to work with you. If you do everything right, you tip that balance of they. there's more of they actually want to do what you want them to do than they want to do what they want to 
want to do more than they don't want to do what you don't want them to do? And that's all, that's a huge part of dog training, man, is keeping that balance where you want it, keeping the relationship good and them wanting to work with you and then having a good training program that works and carrying it out in a way that the dog can understand. That's that's really it. So, and and I would say that's what's happening here. By six months, you might have a dog that's coming on slowly. By the way, some of the dogs that come on really fast turn into a pain in the ass later and aren't that good. Some of the best dogs actually take longer to come on. So don't never get don't get discouraged by a dog taking longer to come on as it's again what i just said a lot of people's best dogs that's a real theme um took a while and a lot of dogs that come on real quick <clears throat> aren't that good later on often due to being a pain in the ass like there's they're too much um, but yeah this should be sorted by six months um, the dog might be interpreting something wrong the dog and probably the most likely scenario is the dog actually thinks it's not meant to sit down until you step in it's just that's just become some, in some way it's become part of the routine for it like I said the dog just thinks oh yeah, he's just said sit Okay, and he's like waiting for you to step in because he thinks that's part of the routine and then he's like, sweet, he stepped in, now I'll sit down. And he's just trying to do um, what he thinks you want him to do. <laughs> and he's just ended up there, you know. It's, and again, um, I must have said this 50 times in, in this podcast now, but um, like in all the podcasts that I've done, um, the smartest dog has the equivalent IQ of a three-year-old human. So a six-month-old dog has the IQ of like a, an 18-month-old baby human. like, And you're not expecting them to understand nothing. <laughs> um, so that's the perspective we're trying to come at this with. Um, so you just got to keep it chill and and try to help them through it. Um, another thing that I've been thinking about quite a bit or that keeps coming up in the process of, you know, working with dogs and for me, and it's come up quite a bit with Miko and retrieving and getting her to do that is um, this whole thing of people, some people say you should only ever give a command once, but I don't think that's necessarily always the best and sometimes you really can use your commands a lot to help the dog to understand what it should be doing and that way they can get better and better I've just seen it over and over like and and because that's one of those old school principles of dog training right I only ever give in training only ever give the command once and then back it up that's like an old cola thing you know and um, man, I've experimented with that for a long time now and just over and over, I try to stick to it as much as I can and I definitely think it's important to lean that way. But the amount of times I've had an ongoing issue with a dog that's difficult to resolve and I've ended up resolving it by using my commands more and then the dog has improved to the point where it knows exactly what I want because I've been communicating with it better. And then I get to the point where I don't uh, where it listens to the command first time, because I went through this phase of using the command a lot, and then I used reading and timing and pressure and praise and all of that good stuff to wean back off it, but. Not like I've had to really work at it. It's just I 
I was trying to use my commands too sparingly. I used them more and quite easily arrived at the point where the dog just knew what it was doing and all of a sudden I'm doing something with the dog. I'm thinking, man, I'm using my words a lot with this dog. I've always heard that's not what you're meant to do, but then like a while later, the dog's just doing the thing and I'm and I'm think even watching footage, I'm like, I, I only said that once then. And she just did it awesome. When I'm re watching video from like this bird season and that, when I remember in training thinking, man, I, like I had to use my command so much sometimes to get her to do it properly but it was me using my commands to help her to do it properly that got her to the point where she was doing it properly and once she to help her understand then once she was doing it properly and she knew that that was the way I wanted her to do it, now she just does it easily with minimal commands. So I think that old rule of only give the command once, two at the most, like, I think that can actually hurt you a bit sometimes and make things difficult and bring unnecessary conflict and unnecessary pressure because you're just, like, trying to say it once and then, and now listen, you know, and you're, like, backing it up with bloody pressure and stuff. Um, whereas sometimes, for example, like, in the, a sit command, and it's impossible for me to say without being there and actually seeing exactly what the dog's doing, what its body language is like, how what your timing and body language is like, and I, I need to see a few drills and stuff. Um, but, for example, in the stop drill, if you're only ever saying sit twice, um, you might be able to say sit, sit, and step halfway in and say, sit, but point. And act like you're going to reach out and say, sit again, sit down. And the pup, the pup's like gears are grinding going, what does he want me to do? Oh, this is the, okay. And then he sits down and goes, oh, I'm allowed to sit down before he steps in and pushes my bum down. And then he sits down and you release all the pressure. You haven't even stepped in move, walk, circle around them, break up the pattern, wait, step back, break it up again, step in, give them a pat, step back, break up the pattern again, give you a go command, walk for a while, separate the drill with time and space, give another one, sit, sit down, sit down, and, it, and the gears grind again, he goes, oh, okay, and he, all of a sudden he sits down without you stepping in. So sometimes, and then you do that a few times, and then maybe the third or fourth time you say sit, and he just sits down. Or you might have to back it up a few more times that session, and the next session he's not even thinking about it anymore because <laughs> dog's thinking processes can be pretty damn basic. It's sort of what happened with print. And then and then I was going through this whole thing with them. And then one day you just, and the next day you walk out there and you just say, sit, and he just sits first pop. Sweet, he, he just clicked. He knows what you want, it, want him to do in that situation now. And he was trying to work it out the whole time. Or... <laughs> He wasn't even really thinking about it that much. He's just like, cool, we're out here walking around. The boss is talking. He's pushing my bum down. He's oh, okay, you know, I'll sit here for a bit. And like, they're just, it's so basic, man. The way some of them are thinking about it, they're just not thinking about it that much. And it just, <laughs> and it just takes uh, sometimes a lot of time and repetition and consistency and patience and good handling to get them there. But, um, yeah, that's a whole thing that, like I say, like my whole think, talk I just had about it there, I have thought about that quite a bit lately and um, just watching Miko come on and stressing out about how much I was using my commands early on versus how good she's ended up being and, and, and also how 
easy and simple the training process was. I didn't use treats. I didn't use a force hold. I didn't use an e collar. I didn't use any of that stuff. I just used reading and timing and understanding and communication. And um, and she's going real good. And she hasn't even done that much hunting yet, you know, really. Um. <clears throat> yeah. Time code. Just type in, in the time code. Remember, so you guys can find skip through to the right questions real quick and easy. Um Dylan. Hi, Paul. I have a 22 week old Vizsla Lab cross call Gus who is doing really well, but over the last week or so, three out of 10 training sessions, 22 weeks, I had to like work that out. <laughs> I think it's five and a half months. I think once your dog gets to like 12 weeks old, just run its age in months, not weeks. Um, otherwise it's like he's 82 weeks old now um, <laughs> and my maths ain't that good I'm a bit like a um, I'm a bit like a lab um, 22 divided by 4 yes yeah, 5 and a half months old um, so sorry starting again bit of a side tangent um 22 week old Vizsla Lab called Gus who's doing really well but over the last week or so 3 out of 10 training sessions he will fall back behind me on a small portion of our walk in the same spot every time so I'll do a change of direction and he is good in the other direction nothing bad has happened in this location it's only a stretch of about 40 metres it does start to feel a bit like he is deciding where we walk. Is this a thing? So he's, that's that whole thing, right? He's starting to think, man, is he, is this dog trying to start to take over here? Is he starting to take the piss? Is he starting to try to decide where, is he trying to, trying to run this show? Um, and they can't, and again, dogs can do that. Dogs can't, I, I've heard that saying. The dogs do not have. I've heard people like, you know, try to come in and take over on a thread on a forum or something. Dogs do not have the ability to take the piss. You're wrong, and this, that, and usually the comment doesn't actually give a a solution <laughs> or a course of action. It's just like some big dominating comment that means one per you're wrong, and but. <laughs> Um, but uh, so dogs can do it but like I said in the previous answer you need to be real careful about going down that route mentally yourself and, and you need to give dogs a lot especially young dogs a lot of benefit of the doubt that they're, they uh, they're not thinking about a lot man they're just a puppy being a puppy just like rocking around and um, it's really all up to us to keep things structured and, and try to help them to understand what we want them to do. And as you do that, if you do it all in the right way and, you, and there's no, you're not too over the top and with pressure and all of that, um, and you keep it all positive and you keep a good bond with the pup, as they work out what you want them to do, man, most of them are pretty happy to do it. Um. Yeah, it's so it does start to feel like he's deciding where we walk. Is this a thing? It's possible, but be very, very careful going down that train of thought. Or is he just tired and wants to go home? That's that's probably far more possible. And as he says next, we are normally out for twenty to thirty minutes three times a day and one freedom session. 20 to 30 minutes three times a day is a lot. It is a lot. And um, so that could be it. 
I'd say you might be overtraining, but I've got a few notes on this, so we'll, we'll keep going. I reckon that's probably the most likely thing here, man. He says, this is the way we need to walk for our water introduction, which he loves, so it's a little frustrating. So, you know, he's like, it doesn't make sense. He loves the water, but then when we're walking out there, he wants to go back. But And again, that can come back to, like, um, he's got the IQ of an 18-month-old baby. So there's not actually that much going on up there, eh? He's just, <laughs> he's just a pup being a pup, like, um, and they offer, they, not much of what they do makes sense, man. It's, you're just really trying to, you know, guide them through it and, and, and create this system with the structure that they can grow up in and become a good dog, you know, there's, it's, um, and a lot of that involves a lot of just patience and consistency and and really good communication from your side in order to do that. Um, he goes on to say, I also I have also tried walking faster to get him in front, which normally works, but he will just keep walking behind for this area. So that's I go over a whole thing of that in dog training called clarity of intent. And sometimes with a younger dog, like if we, because they're so, <laughs> well, this theme that I keep hitting on here, you know, that there's not a lot going on up there, and they take quite a bit to come on and understand what we're trying to do here. Um, sometimes even just getting the message across that this is the way we're walking, and we're going to walk there every day, and I want you to be in front, so let's just walk that way with you in front every day. Even that can take a long time for it to sink in. And even, you know, and for it to be three times out of ten, you could you could almost just put that down to that's normal, you know. Three times out of ten, yeah, maybe a pattern that if he's doing it the same place every day, it seems a bit unusual. But then three times out of ten, with a five and a half month, how many times has he done three times out of ten? Is it, you know, how many times has he done it overall? Has he done it three times out of ten for 50 sessions? That would be, I'd be like, there's something going on there. But if he's only doing it three times out of ten in one spot, I'd probably just be like, man, dogs are funny and just keep doing my part and just wait for it to go away, you know, because it's not a huge deal, really. If he's not, as long as he's not tearing off behind you or yanking on the long line or doing something weird, crazy, barking, biting the long line, jumping up at you, biting your ankles. Or so. If he's just like, I don't know, just wants to walk behind for that little bit, I'd like to know how long that six segment is too. And where in the walk it is. Is it in the middle, the end, or the start? Um, but yeah, I'd tend to lean on that. Like, all right, if you want to, you know, you're a five and a half month old pup. We're like not even halfway through this whole training thing. If you want to walk behind, you can walk behind for that little bit. But I wouldn't let him do it. I wouldn't want him to do it forever, but I'd give him a good while to like get out of it. And as long as he's walking in front for most of it, it wouldn't be a huge issue. But um, yeah, I've also tried. But yeah, sometimes walking faster. Sometimes if if you're just walking nice and slow, the pup's walking slow, and you're walking nice and slow behind it, and then everything slows right down to a bit of a dawdle. Then the pup starts getting distracted and veering off and going behind and all of that. If often if you just pick up the pace and there's a whole segment on that in the blueprint and clarity of intent and clarity of intent and training and it sort of goes into a lot of the stuff I've been talking about a lot over the last while on this podcast. Um, just making it really easy for a young pup to understand what we're actually trying to get them to do. Sometimes something is just a nice brisk walk, nice and deliberately in one direction can make them go oh shit okay and they'll 
become a bit more engaged and walk in front and it'll t- it can speeding up a bit can tidy things up instead of being a bit wishy-washy and dawdly. Um, and Dylan goes on to say, by the way, wanted to say thank you for the blueprint. It's fantastic and really appreciate all the work that you've done to benefit so many others. Thanks, bro. Appreciate it. Um, so here's some notes on this. Um, it's kind of unusual, but definitely not unheard of, man. Like, especially a bit earlier on like that for pups to um, dawdle around a bit and hang back sometimes and um, even do it in the same place every time. Like, dogs are... <laughs> dogs can do some weird things at times man and and who knows what's going on in their head to cause them to do that but sometimes and definitely in training when they're young you have there needs to be a bit of give and take at times and you just sort of have to like you know yeah try sort of laugh at them and and but at the while at the same time thinking about what you can do to try and help them to do it better but like take it all with a grain of salt you know and try to keep pretty light-hearted about it as long as it's a sort of a long term uh, excuse me a, a short term thing that doesn't really matter that much if you can carry on and keep making progress like sometimes you've got to give them a bit of leeway um it is kind of unusual though and um, I wouldn't stress about it. It doesn't sound like a big deal. It's hard to say exactly without seeing it and seeing the dog's body language as it does it. But um, the biggest thing that stands out here for me is that three 30-minute sessions a day is a lot and um, you could replace some of those with just another freedom session or a chill session inside. You know, once we get to the point in the blueprint where the dog can come inside and sit next to you and just spend a bit of time with it. Um, and maybe try and lighten up the pressure a bit. Again, it's hard to say because I haven't seen your training, but if you're thinking about this this much, then I'm guessing you're being pretty tight with most other things as well, which is great. A lot of training and doing everything well is really important. But you can overtrain. You actually can. And... Um, Sometimes that's what I did. Ended up doing that's what I did with Miko a hundred percent last season. Um, I tried to do too much with it too fast, and it was it was uh, um, it, there's definitely diminishing returns. And um, sometimes in dog training, a lot of the time, it's make haste slowly. And um, so it might just be that man. And again, it's hard to say because I haven't seen it. It might not be that, but. Um, I'll throw in a few things out there. Hopefully something there helps. Um, but I would, I would definitely the first thing I would do is drop a session a day and just if, you, if you've been pretty full on, just lighten up a bit. Otherwise, it just if it's not a major and he's not doing anything cr- crazy and it's as simple as he's just cr- dawdling behind for a small segment, just let him do it and see if he gets over it in the next month or so. Um, And if it doesn't, and it gets worse, or it just never goes away, um, then let us know. But um, yeah, you're doing a lot of training sessions, and if you're doing them always in the same place, it can get boring too. And getting out and training somewhere else can help a lot. Yeah. Um, So that's it, guys. That's it for this Q&A. Um, if you want to find out more about the Deer Dog Training Blueprint or the Palmico Dog Guide, the Palmico Dog Guide is my general dog training video series for non-hunters. Uh, you can check that out, biggameindicatingdogs.com for the Deer Dog Training Blueprint. You can check out the Palmico Dog Guide at palmicodogtraining.com. You can check out Big Game Indicating Dogs on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. You can check out Palmico Dog Training on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And you can check out my own personal stuff at Paul John Michaels on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube as well. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in the next one.